My name is Marie Jackson, and I'm a research scientist at UC Berkeley in civil and environmental engi engineering. Well, um, I was working in Rome and looking at ancient Roman concretes, and Romans have a word for these materials called pozzolana, and that's pretty much the first time I heard about it is from Romans talking about Pozzolana deposits around Rome. I went to Rome for a year with my family when my children were little and started looking at buildings and never stopped. <laughs> when I started looking around me and realized that all of those buildings were made of volcanic rock or concrete made with volcanic rock, it was just stupendously fascinating. Well, we'll have to step back a little bit here. When we look at lithified volcanic tufts, even if you hold a piece of that rock in your hand, you'll see that it's made up of a lot of volcanic particles, pumice and glass and crystals. And in between the particles, there's often a white colored cement that's a, usually a zeolite or calcite cement I've worked in Rome and on the architectural monuments of Rome and on the seawater concretes. So these were construction projects that had a lot of um, sort of organization and um, financial support for these materials. My studies have shown that Romans first started making viable concretes in Rome around 150 BC. And the aggregates that they used for those concretes, those mortars, were in most cases dug out of the deposit on which the monument was going to be built. Sometime around 50 BC, Romans began to really perfect mortar technologies. So that by the time of Augustus, they had developed a mortar that used a specific volcanic ash deposit, Pozzolani Rose, which is a very big ignimbrite that was erupted about 457,000 years ago. Well, this is a scoriaceous ash, so these are particles of scoria that have a great deal more um, iron and magnesium than a pumice would have, a light-colored pumice. And by virtue of sitting on the Earth's surface for thousands of years, began to grow specific mineral coatings. In the upper part of the deposit, these were mainly um, clay mineral and opal surface coatings, haloisite, which is somewhat similar. It's like nature's of equivalent to a metacaolin. And then when, where this very thick um, ignimbrite deposit was altered in groundwater, there were zeolites. So it was the volcanic glass and these surface textures that reacted with lime to form very durable cementitious hydrates. One is a calcium aluminum silicate hydrate that's extraordinarily durable. And the principal mineral, the principal crystalline cementitious hydrate is stratlingite. So what we're looking at in these imperial Roman concrete mixes, which we have reproduced at Cornell University, and we've had several papers published on the last two years, um, is a material that is made of lime, hydrated with fresh water, where paste is made of lime, and pozzolana rose ash is mixed in with the lime. These are scoriaceous particles with a very wide particle size distribution, down to um, very, very fine sand sized to even pebble-sized. So in these mortars, the pozzolan and the aggregate are the same material. There's just a size gradation. And 
they all have pozzolanic properties. So early on in the hydration of this mixture, calcium aluminum silicate hydrate mm, lumps may form. And over the next 28 to 56 days, these grow into the CASH binder. In addition, stratlingite crystals start to form that crystallize around the perimeters of the grains. These are platy crystals. They grow through the cementitious matrix and around the fa interfacial zones of the scoria. There are so many of them that they act like fiber reinforcements. Romans actually made a fiber-reinforced concrete, but this material grew these crystals itself, these platy crystals that interact. So what does that mean? That means that interfacial zones, the bonding with the cementitious matrix is very complex, where cracks usually nucleate in modern concretes. There's a dense network of plates around the interfacial zone so that cracks can't propagate very far. In addition, in the cementitious matrix, there's more plates. So we're looking at a material that has a pretty good fracture toughness. It may not have very high compressive strength, but it can resist cracking, and it continues to grow stratlingite crystals way into the history of the concrete. And so it probably has good self-healing properties as well. I really think it has to do with the nature of the Pozzolan. And Romans knew that so that they had a different design mix for walls versus the big concrete vaulted domes of their structures, and they had a different mix for the seawater concretes. So they were specifically choosing volcanic ash deposits and volcanic ash blends to highlight certain material properties that they wanted in their concretes. So I think we need to be doing the same thing. Um, I could give you several instances of what different pozzolans could potentially do. And one thing that we would also want to think about is hydration in fresh water versus hydration with seawater. Um, so there's so many different areas that could be enhanced with pozzolans that it would need to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis for many of these applications. Well, it's hard to say that any structure that has persisted for 2,000 years is a failure, um, for sure. There are examples in Roman texts of failures of buildings, many of them, um, by Cicero and other authors. And one of the main apparent causes for failure was called cheating on lime. People made mortars and they didn't put sufficient lime in the mortar and bonding didn't take place. So yes, in antiquity, I'm sure there were many failures. And right now, the one of the biggest factors is how well that monument has been maintained mm -hmm. th through the last um, 1,500 years. Lime is the most, was the most expensive component of this mortar. The mortar was composed of water, hydrated lime, and volcanic ash or in certain cases, ground brick. So lime had to be quarried from limestone. Uh, usually, I think, calcined either at the quarry or on the building site. 
transferred to the mortar mixing device without carbonation. And um, I would guess that some builders were not scrupulous in using the correct amount of lime for a given mix. As a cost cutting. As a cost cutting, or even if they simply didn't have the material, maybe it was hard to come by. Well, I do, and I think one of the things that we can do is go back to the 1930s and 1940s for Western U.S. concrete production. There's several really pertinent publications written about the use of natural putzlons in infrastructure concretes that show how much people were thinking about optimizing the performance of concretes and um, the preparation of pozzolans for those materials. We know that pozzolans were used um, around the turn of the century in Los Angeles, and there's not that much written about that. However, in the 1950s, the early 1950s, there were some really important review articles describing the technologies that had been developed from the 1930s and 40s. These are large scale projects, but I think there's a lot of information on deposits that we already know about at some level here in the West and how to use these in, in different types of mixes to enhance concrete durability and mitigate any possible problems that pozzolans would deliver to the concrete.